Good morning and welcome to our worship service today. Glad to have all of you with us today for our Mother's Day service. Let me say Happy Mother's Day if I haven't seen you yet. I tried to get around to as many of you as I could, but Happy Mother's Day to all the moms here. I'll say Happy Mother's Day to my mom. She's watching right now, I'm sure. So, uh, but great day to celebrate our mothers and all that they do for us. We have some gifts for you before you leave. If you check these out on the way out and a flower for you, we'll get that to you as well. Just a small gift of appreciation and love for all that you do for your families and for the church and the community around us. So we're going to have a great day of worship together. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for our mothers, for all that they've done for us, all the ways that we've been blessed by them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Jesus, like thank you for being here or 
in a place of surrender like, Jesus, I just need you. And I, I am just dwelling in that today and just speaking Jesus and the peace and the comfort that follows that name regardless of what's going on in life. to go with that. One is how grateful I am that God was watching over me before I even knew he was. And when I, because of choices I had made in my past, was struggling to become a mom and I was losing babies, God saw the hurt and the the ache in me and knew my heart and that I wanted to be a mom and he blessed me with a little girl born in China who didn't have a mom to love her and he put us together He's, he picked me specifically for my baby girl and we got home and five months later I'm pregnant with this beautiful lady right here standing next to me. He blessed me. And it's because of him that I get to celebrate mothers today. And also, in all of that, he knew my heart that I wanted to be a mom. And he allowed me to be the director to start this preschool next door. And for over 100 kids, I was a surrogate mom five days a week. And now I'm at high school and these kids, they need moms. And I am so, so grateful to be able to celebrate Mother's Day with Tyler this morning, being here and wanting to, for me to be that surrogate mom for him. God is great. And God serves, and he wants to please us. He wants us to be, have all of those things that we desire in our heart to come true. And I look back then, and I wonder, how did he do this? But he did it, and I'm so grateful to celebrate today.
that we're going to show to honor our mothers and we're going to read a scripture and pray. Today is a beautiful day of celebration. A day to honor the women who've shaped us, nurtured us, and walked us through life. It's a day to say thanks to all the moms. Moms with toddlers tearing through the house, 
and moms whose babies have moved away. Moms who are doing this all by themselves and moms who loved a child in need. Moms who have suffered unimaginable loss and moms whose children are moms themselves. For all the times your love made things better and the moments your wisdom made things clear, for the way you lived as an example, so we could see Jesus through you. For each and every memory that has lit the path we walk, we say thank you. Whether this is a day of celebration, reflection, or heartache, know that you are loved. Happy Mother's Day. I've been thinking about this scripture all week. It goes with the message and it goes with Mother's Day. It's from Psalm 139. It says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Hear these words. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Isn't that wonderful? When we think about Mother's Day and we think about our kids and all that they mean to us, it's, I just stand in awe of the majesty of the God that we serve. How can we look at little kids and not believe in a God who formed them and fashioned them with a purpose? We're going to pray right now, and then we're going to sing a little bit more. But I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with me, and let's pray a special prayer for the moms and all the ladies and the sound of our hearing today. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and goodness. We thank you for moms who made sacrifices for us, who my mom made sure I knew about Jesus at a young age parents who took us to church. I'm so thankful for that heritage that I have. I'm thankful for the kids that we have, for my wife, who is the mother of our children, and the wonderful job she did raising our kids. What a testimony they are to her, her faithfulness and your faithfulness and goodness. And I, I think of all the moms represented in this room, moms that are raising kids that are in the thick of it now, moms who have raised kids and now are helping with grandkids, maybe raising grandkids and have great grandkids and are just today in awe of your faithfulness and your goodness and how through the years you've taken care of them and expanded the family and helped them to lead and to guide and direct this family that they have. And I know we're all so thankful for the joy that the, our families bring to us. And God, I also recognize that this is a day of heartache and pain for some. Some have lost mothers, maybe this year. And this day brings up some sadness, understandably. This day is a, a tough day for parents who've had to bury their own children. We ask you to comfort them today. Minister to them only as you can, Father. Be their comforter and their counselor and make good memories flood their memories today. And God, we pray that as we go through this service that we would have a new sense of awe for the great God that we really do serve. And we pray all of this in the great name of Jesus. Would you stand with us one more time? And man, you guys are knocking it out of the park on worship. I'm, been, I'm standing back there listening, and I even walked to the back just because I want. It was so loud and so vibrant. I wanted to see it. And I was watching hands go up and tears down faces. Let's just take a little bit more time to tell God how grateful we are for what a great God He is. Let's sing together.
great God a big hand clap. Yes. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. Didn't they do a great job, as always, leading us in worship? Thankful for you. Let's pray one more time before we go into the message. Father, I just pray that as we go into looking at your word together, that your spirit would speak. And God, amazing things happen when the spirit and the word come together. And we're praying that you would hover over this place and take the word of God and bring about new creation in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Kids, you can go ahead and be dismissed for Kids Church at this time. Miss Abby is back there at the back waiting on you. For four weeks now, we have been exploring some tough questions about God, questions that people have about God. Today, we're going to tackle the big question, evolution or creation, is it right, which one is right? I've got to admit to you, when I, when I started doing the calendar and saw evolution, creation, Mother's Day, I was like, oh man, I don't know if this works. But I've got to tell you, as I kind of worked on the message that came to me, this really does work pretty well. Where did we come from? I mean, think about it. When, that first time you held that baby in your hands, what a moment of awe that was, right? I mean, that's on the highlight reel of my life. How, how can anybody look down at that baby and not think, man, someone had to create this. Th this can't just be chance. I mean, I, I, I think evolution's convenient up until about the time you're holding your own baby in your hand, right? H how does that happen? We're going to talk about that today. And maybe a good place to start is all the way back in 1859. Why in the world would we do that? Well, a guy by the name of Charles Darwin wrote a book in 1859 called The Origin of Species. He was an English man, and he uh, believed he had come up with the, the, the origin of life, and he referred to it as natural selection. And basically, he, he believed and, po and posited this theory, and it became very popular that the most productive, the most superior parts of an organism stayed alive long enough to be able to produce and then they reproduced and they reproduced at a rate that the lesser forms of organisms went away and he called that natural selection. There's a lot more to it than that but let me just read a basic definition for you today. The basic idea of Darwinian evolution is that all species of organisms arise and develop through the natural selection of small inherited variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce. All life on Earth can be traced back to a single moment, now hear this, when non-life gave birth to a simple form of life. That's convenient, isn't it? I, I don't, I, I'm going to try to, I need to be, be good here. And over time, that life form grew, reproduced, and mutated over millions of years, into all the microbes, magnolias, minnows, monkeys, and men in world in our, that you see in our world today. So the formula for Darwinian evolution is this. Time plus chance plus natural selection equals all life on Earth. That's it in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it than that. I don't have time to go into it in that. Now, if you were raised in a public school, chances are you were in an environment that pretty well promoted Darwinian evolution, whether or not you knew that that was what they were doing or not. So I'm, I'm going to be right out with it today. Since that's what most people have heard, I'm going to look at some of the downsides of Darwinian evolution today quickly. We're just going to point some things out that at least I hope will make some people think uh, if, if that's something that you subscribe to. Number one, first of all, statistics point away from evolution. Evolution is all about reproduction. And reproduction, what Darwin did not know in his defense, it was 1859 and they just didn't know it then, reproduction is a very complex process. On a micro level, let me read again, it's made up of reactions from amino acids, proteins, enzymes, DNA and RNA and a few other wonders that carry and decipher the information necessary to reproduce cells and creatures. One scientist that's there on your screen said, that the possibility of life's simplest organism coming into being without help as 1 in 10 with 4,925 zeros behind it. That's a big number, right? That's a big problem, I think. Do you agree? I mean, that, 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 that's not likely, uh, uh, by the, the, to make the understatement of all understatements. Number two, 
species in our world are retreating, not advancing. Listen to what this geneticist said. This is the second law of thermodynamics. He's from Cornell University. John Sanford said, that said the process of mutation is relentless and is destroying us, not creating us. We are heading for extinction along with every other complex organism. This is what the second law of thermodynamics uh, predicts. So again, that's another problem. Third, nature has too many irreducible complexities. Uh, we, we talked about this in the first week, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time right here. But you think about just a kneecap, <laughs> you know? Just what, um, what uh, wonder and amazement there is with all of the elements that go into just the production of a kneecap. Francis Collins, he's the director of the National Institute of Health in America. He actually was a leader of 2,000 scientists that mapped the three billion letters of the human genome. That's basically the DNA instruction book. He's a smart guy. He, he's seen a lot of things in science. He said this, I cannot see how nature could have created itself. Only a supernatural force that is outside of space and time could have done that. That's pretty close to an idea of God there, right? We're going to keep unpacking that. Then, there is the negative impact of evolution, the theory of evolution, on just ethics and a person's purpose in life. Now, most people who know anything about Charles Darwin and the book that he wrote on the origin of species, that's, that's probably, I bet, the only name or title, the part of the title of that book that you've heard. Did you know that there's a rest of the name of that book? Listen to the name of this book. On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, and hear this, or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. How in the world has this guy not been canceled in the culture that we live in? I mean, people have done a lot less than this, right? He wrote a book later called The Descent of Man, said at some future period not very dis distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. They don't tell you this piece in school, okay? This, these are the pieces that get left out. During World War I, the first eugenics society was founded in Germany based on these kinds of principles. And it led to the killing of six million Jews, gypsies, and disabled people, or anybody else that didn't fit the idea of a favored race. In the United States, unfortunately, not a good point in our history, in the 1920s and 30s, eugenics uh, societies uh, sterilized 70,000 people who fell into the target of mentally retarded, deaf, blind, people with epilepsy, criminals, and other issues that they deemed that they didn't want to pass on. And Joseph Stalin, as a child, was influenced heavily by On the Origin of Species, written by Charles Darwin, and his great purge in Russia led to the death of 30 million people. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense it doesn't, but it kind of does, that if all we are is a random assortment of molecules that just kind of sprung up by chance with no real purpose, and it really is survival of the fittest, you can kind of understand in a back way, backward way, why they came up with this. That's what really the natural end of what this teaching is teaching. So with that foundation in place, I want to turn to the Bible. And we've been, in the, we've been in the back of the book. We've done a lot of study on Revelation here in the church. I want to invite you to the first page of your Bible, to Genesis chapter 1. Go ahead and turn there with me. Genesis chapter 1 is a, is a masterpiece of literature. It's a miracle of recorded history. If you want to know why I believe this is true, I would invite you to go back to my second sermon in this series, How We Know Scripture is Reliable. I'm not going to go back and do that again. I've already laid that foundation. This is re uh, I believe what we're reading is the Word of God and is an account of how God created the world. 
this story is told with symmetry, style, and grace. It begins in Genesis 1 with God working. The, story, the first part of the story ends in Genesis chapter 2, 3 with God resting. It says in Genesis 1, 1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the very first verse of the Bible. Okay? Is it any wonder people that want to get rid of God in society like a theory of evolution that says you don't need God. If you can disprove the first verse of the Bible, they're on their way to disproving God, right? There is more about this than just the teaching of a scientific theory is what I'm trying to teach to get across to you. Verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So verse 1 gives us the uh, statement, God created the world. Verse 2 gives us sort of a problem, but God doesn't have problems. But it says the earth was formless and empty. What was formless needed formed. What was empty needed, em what was empty needed filled. And, and then the rest of chapter 1 is the laying out of how God does this. And it's amazing how he does this. I'm going to give you two sets of slides that you can follow with here. The first three days of creation are God forming. Light is formed. Water is formed in the sky. Water formed on the surface. Dry land is formed. Vegetation is formed. Then watch what happens on days four through six. You not only have lights, but now you have a sun and a moon. You not only have a sky, you now have birds filling the sky. You no longer have just a sea, you have fish and all the other sea animals filling the sea. You no longer have just dry land, you now have fruits and vegetables and all the other parts of creation that God created. Forming, then fill, filling. And it's amazing how God writes this. Every day begins with every statement in the, uh, the days of creation says, and God said, let there be. It begins every day just the same. Five of the days ends with, and it was so. Six of the days, the six days of creation, end with a beautiful benediction that God, when God says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day, and every day ends with, and God saw that it was good. His creation is good. So what happened in the beginning? That's the big question, isn't it? How did it all begin? Well, Genesis 1, 1 gives us the answer. In the beginning, God created. Now, if you have a Bible, and you're one who marks in your Bible, I would that's a, ver, wor, a word that I would highlight right there, created. It's a really neat word. It comes from the Hebrew word, bara. Say that with me. Say bara. It means to create without nothing. Creation out of nothing. Where does it all begin? According to Genesis 1-1, it begins with a creator, God, who spoke something out of nothing. Creation out of nothing. Even Francis Collins, he acknowledged, let me look at it to make sure I get it right. He said, I cannot see how nature could have created itself. Only a supernatural force that is outside of space and time could have done that. You know, here's the thing. Whether you choose to believe in evolution or creation, you got to operate on faith either way you go. There's a whole lot of faith in evolution. I mean, a lot of random chance and just, just the, like I said, the kneecap and the complexities of a kneecap. How does that, how does that in and of itself, by itself, become a kneecap and then coordinate with the rest of the body? And as, I've, as we talked about four weeks ago, you remove one piece of the universe and it starts all just kind of spinning out of control really quickly. It's all so intricately put together. God created out of nothing. But then there's another Hebrew word called asa, and that means form, or to manufacture by design. The word bara, created out of nothing, is used three times. The rest of the time it's uh, referring to form. So let's just walk through this a little bit. Genesis 1, chapter 3, is day 1. Now life requires photosynthesis and and photosynthesis requires light. And in day one, God said, let there be light. The very first thing he creates is light. We can't live without it. 
So I want you to, as we go through this, I want you to just kind of pay attention to the progression that God takes as he puts all this together. So day one, and God said, let there be light. Then we go to day two, which is verse six, God, and it says, and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate the water from water. A vault between the waters. There we have the water cycle. One of the most important processes of life. We need light, we need water. Water vapors form in the sky as clouds and moisture comes down as rain or sleet or snow. And then we have the evaporation in the ocean that sends it back up into the atmosphere and it's almost like it, it's almost like it's living, isn't it? It's like living water as Jesus referred to himself. God is putting this all together piece by piece. He's got a design. He's going somewhere with this. It's an intelligent designer. So we're getting closer and closer to a definition for God there. Verse 9 says, uh, uh, this is day 3, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry ground appear. We actually have two let there be's on day three, but let me talk about the dry ground first. I want to read something that is just another example of the intricate complexity and the way that God so uh, intelligently with the design put things together. 30% of our earth is dry ground, 70% is water. Due to recent scientific research, we now know that there's a lot of tectonic activity going on underneath the Earth. This allows for Earth to maintain 30% of its dry ground. So let me read this. Try to, try to focus. It's kind of like science, so I understand it can be a little difficult at least if you're wired like I am. It says, then, th I'm sorry, this 30-70 land water surface split provides us with different altitudes, climates, topographies, and in environments, all of which enable a huge level of biological diversity. The natural process of erosion continually washes dirt, rocks, and sand back into the ocean. Land continues to be renewed by new deposits through volcanoes and tectonic plate activity. Tides enrich our coastal zones and continental shelves with nutrients, simultaneously sanitizing them of waste and toxins. Now hear this, without these processes, life would be threatened and over time, life on earth or the earth would become a uniform ball of rock covered in water a mile and a half deep. Again, think about the intricate design. There's got to be an intelligent designer behind all this. Also on day three, you have the vegetation created. There wasn't anybody to eat it yet, but are you starting to notice the progression? First we have light, then we have water. Now we're gonna put sources of food on earth. At that point, it was just for oxygen production, fertilization, preservation, or something like that. Let's go to day four now, verse 14. So we've got light created in verse three. In verse 14 it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as times to mark sacred times and seasons and days and years. So now we not only just have a general source of light, we have a sun for day and we have a moon for the evening. And then Moses adds a little bit of an editorial note there verse 16, God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. Think about the stars. Millions, billions of stars that God created. The, the Bible says he's named them and it, it, it says that, 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 there are, are, that he told um, Abraham you're going to have more children than even on the sand of the sea as part of your offspring. God created this rich diversity in our world. And then let's go to day five. It starts in verse 20. And God said, let the water team with living creatures, let birds fly above the earth. And then in verse 21, it says, so God created. I want to note two things there. One, we no longer just have a sky we have our first living creatures on day five. 
Why did not God just create the living creatures first? Wouldn't have had anything to eat, right? I've decided I'm going to add a what about Bob section in each sermon. Thank you, Bob. They wouldn't have had anything to eat, right? You see the progression here. God's preparing the world for animals and humans to have a safe place to live. An intelligent designer. But now we're taking another step, aren't we? He's a caring designer. He doesn't want to just put us on earth and us have to flounder around wondering what we're going to eat every day, right? He's preparing it for us, a safe place, so that when we're on earth, there won't be too much sun that, that fries us because it's too close to us or freezes us because it's too far away from us. He, he's putting this together for us to have a wonderful place to live. And then we move down to day six. A lot happens on day six. Verse 24 says, And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. And it goes on in verse 25 to continue to lay out the other animals that are created. Also, interestingly, when it says that God created the sea creatures in verse 21, that's the second time that God uses the word bara. God created out of nothing. He created animals. They have a will. They have an intellect. They have emotions. And he creates that out of nothing. And then we keep going down to verse 26. Then it says, then God said, this is the crown achievement. This is what all of creation was moving toward. Let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock, the animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now keep in mind, this is before the fall in Genesis 3. We talked last week about God created a perfect world. Animals and humans were living together in harmony. Animals were not afraid of humans. Humans were not afraid of animals. God created a perfect place for them, a safe place for them. But then Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, we read the account of their sin, and it sent everything off its axis, so to speak. And then there was fear, and then there was danger, and then there was sin and death, and all of these things that we're dealing with today in this world. But that hasn't happened yet. God created, and again, that's the word bara. That's the third time. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Chew on that a while later today and see what that might imply. I don't have time to go into it. Verse 27, or let's keep going to verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it. That just means to govern it, to govern it well. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. God created these plants and these trees before he put man and woman on earth so that, again, they would have something to eat. He created it a safe place. He created a place where they could live and eat and be healthy. And verse 31 says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Let me highlight a couple things right now. As we get, we're going to start wrapping this thing up now. First of all, you, you don't get out of this world without faith. If you want to choose to not believe in God, you have that choice. God gives you that. You, you are created with free will to choose whether or not you're going to believe in God. But that in itself is a faith statement. By saying there's no God, by basing your life on that, you are, ba you are saying that we're wrong. Christians don't, what, what Christians teach about the afterlife, that's not real, that's not true. Well, how do you know that? that that's a faith statement. You can't prove that scientifically, right? So you're going you're gonna to choose faith one way or the other. You're either going to choose faith to not believe in God or you're going to choose to believe in God, you're either going to choose to believe in evolution or you're going to choose to believe in creation. That's a faith statement either way because at the end of the day, there's an awful lot of faith 
when you choose the evolution route. In fact, I think I could say pretty uh, clearly with enough evidence that I've already shown, it takes more faith to believe evolution than it does to believe in an intelligent, caring designer who made us. And that leads us to what I really want to focus on as we close today. We've watched the progression. Somewhere in the eternal annals of history, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this is the Steve Stubbles version, okay, <laughs> had a meeting together. And God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they've existed from all time. No beginning, no ending. They love each other perfectly. Jesus said in the book of John, as the Father has loved me, hear these words, I want you to hear this today. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You are amazingly loved. Everybody in this room, everybody watching, everybody listening, everybody who will see this later, you are amazingly loved. I just read a verse to you. If I could count the number of his precious thoughts for me, they would outnumber the grains of sand on the earth. God loves you. Somewhere before this world was even created, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they love each other so much that they did something parents do. We love each other so much, we'd like to bring some kids into the world. And we'd like to share our love with them. And out of that joyful love, they came up with a plan to create us, to create humans. But they knew that these humans were going to need a safe place to live. So just like a mother preparing a nursery for her baby, <laughs> in the eternal councils of heaven, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit unleash all their creativity, all their creative power, all the designs that their imagination could come up with and think about the perfect world to put us in. Like I said last week, if somebody says to you, why didn't God create the world perfect, just to tell them he did. That, that's what it was before we messed it up. And then step by step, light, water, plants, making it safe for us, giving us food to eat, and then after all of that's done, then God said, let us make mankind in our own image. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Here's what separates men and women from every other creation that God has made. We have the ability to have a, a relationship with God. We're the only part of creation that God made that can know him that can have a relationship with him, that can choose to love him back or not to love him back, that can choose to respond to obey him or not to respond and obey him. We have that choice, but we were created with that capacity. And think about this. I have the capacity any moment of the day as a child of God to have a conversation with the creator of the world through Jesus Christ and his death for my sins. I mean, let me just ask you a question. What, what's really bothering you right now? What, what, what is weighing you down with anxiety? What is stressing you out right now? Well, can I just encourage you to remember how great is our God? Those are more than just words to a song. In fact, the psalmist says, uh, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? And then he answers his own question. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We have nothing we're going through in our life right now that God cannot handle. And a Christian has the opportunity at any moment to just look up to the creator of the world and say, God, I've got a big problem. And that creator of the world can look back down and say, I've got this, I can handle it. Because our problems are important to God, but they're small compared to what he can handle. So we can take those problems to him. God wants to have a relationship with us. He wants it to be an eternal relationship with us. We were created to know him, but then Adam and Eve sinned, and all of us were born into the world fallen from God. We make choices, we rebel against God, and then we hear the gospel, 
We, we have a Christian friend who starts praying for us, and they start inviting us to church. And we start hearing about this God who loves us. Unfortunately, some people have seen some... I, I hear the experiences sometimes what people have had in churches, and they're unfortunate, but... And they say to me, you know, I went to a church and I just didn't feel like they wanted me or didn't love me or whatever. I don't know what happened there, but I want you to know God wants you. God loves you. Here's how much. He sent his son. He allowed Jesus, his only son, to come into the world and to die for your sin. Jesus rose again. And we're given the promise that if we will repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and put our faith in Jesus that he'll forgive our sins and we'll have a relationship with him and we can live with him forever in a new heaven and a new earth where Jesus will rule from the new Jerusalem in a perfect world. It began in the garden and it'll end in a garden. And God's saying to you today, if you will give your life to me, I will forgive your sins and you can have a relationship with me. You don't have to go through this life alone. In this world, you have had trouble, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You don't have any choice whether or not you're going to have trouble in this world. The only choice you have is will you have Jesus when the trouble comes, the maker of heaven and earth. And he made it this simple. He, sa- he tells us in John chapter 112, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Simply believe and receive. Believe in Jesus, the Son of God, who died for the forgiveness of your sin. Receive him into your life. Let him lead you. And then watch the new creation that explodes out of your life. Let me give you one more illustration before we go. I I found this reading this week. I love this. After a woman gives birth, it says, when she is holding her baby, her core body temperature will raise by as much as two degrees in order to keep the baby warm. Research has shown that even tiny premature babies can be kept warm with skin-to-skin contact with their mother, and you don't have to worry about the length of time that they are out of the incubator as long as they are with their mother because her body will regulate her temperature keep the baby warm. Now listen to this. This is the only time in a woman's life when her core body temperature will increase that much and that quickly. One of those amazing human design features of our creator. Friends, that creator wants to have a relationship with you. That's why you were created. To know God and to love God and to be known by God, and to be loved by God. If you would, would you bow your heads with me? I'm going to pray a prayer in a moment. I want to read this prayer. I want you to listen to this prayer. God, I believe you made me. I believe I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You made me to love me. You have an eternal purpose for me. I believe Jesus died and rose again for me. Please forgive me and my sins. I surrender to you. Come into my life and help me begin this new life with you right now in Jesus' name. I want you to think about the words of the prayer that I just read. I'm going to pray, I'm going to read these again in a moment. And what I'm going to do right now in a moment is I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, if you've not turned your life over to him, I'm going to invite you to pray that prayer with me in a moment. To to make this day, this Mother's Day 2023, the day that you became a child of God. A loving Heavenly Father who's with you whatever you go through. So let's pray for a moment, and then I'll give you this opportunity. Father, I pray in the next few moments that anybody here, maybe they once knew you and had a relationship with you, and they've 
walked away from that relationship or they've never, they've never made this commitment. They've never turned their life over to you. God, I pray that in this moment, this would be the day of a life change for them. To begin to experience the purpose for which they were made, to know you and to love you and to be known and loved by you. So I'm going to pray that prayer right now. And if you're ready, I'm just going to invite you right now to pray it right there at your feet. Just say this to God from your heart. God, I believe that you made me. I believe I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that you made me to love me and that you have an eternal purpose for me. I believe Jesus died again and rose for me. God, I ask you to please forgive me, forgive me of my sins, God, right here, right now, I surrender my life to you. Come into my life and help me begin this new life with you right now. In Jesus' name. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed, nobody looking around right now. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand right now and put it right back down? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Father, we thank you for these folks who have made a recommitment to you or a first-time commitment to you. God, I pray right now that your spirit would verify and certify within them through the working of your Holy Spirit that they are indeed your child. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Just a couple of announcements before we go. Ushers, you can go ahead and come on forward. I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, um, just real quick, we have a check for from Nancy Shore. Nancy, I'm you're not 100 years old, are you? That's for 100 dollars. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, that's what threw me off a little bit. <laughs> Uh, Just a couple of announcements for you. Next week, we will have our first car show meeting. We begin at 5 o'clock. I don't know. Whatever it says in the bullet and do what it says. Uh, We have the first one to kick it off. We had a great car show last year. If you're interested at all in learning about our car show, being a part of it, the information is there in your worship folder. Check it out and join us uh, for that. Next week is Membership Sunday. We're also doing uh, Graduation Sunday. A lot of things going on next week, so you want to be a part of that. Um, and I think that was all I had. Ushers, thank you. Let's pray for this offering and we'll be dismissed after the offering. Father, thank you for this day. We uh, thank you for your faithfulness to us, all that you give to us and provide for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you as you give at this time.
Let me say one more time, Happy Mother's Day. Father, I pray a blessing over every lady, every mother in the room, and I pray that this day would be a day of joy and uh, good memories and reflections. And I pray your peace and grace upon everyone here. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Mother's Day.